Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. <laughs> Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Hey guys, Todd Helms with another episode of Eastman's Wingman Podcast. That is the name we have finally settled on. We were kicking around a few. Thanks for your patience on that. You guys can find us on just about any place that you want to listen to your podcasts. We're everywhere out there. SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, Google Play, you name it, we're on it. So we've got RSS feeds up all over the place. So do that search for Eastman's Wingman Podcast and you'll find what you're looking for. Today, I have the honor of talking to Mr. Kelly Powers, who is a champion of champions, goose caller, um, part, I guess, part owner or operator of Final Flight Outfitters, uh, owner operator of Power Calls. Am I getting that right, Kelly? Man, you've got a, yeah. you're a man of many talents. Yeah, I got a lot of irons in the fire, I guess, but, you know, been, been blessed. I mean, goodness doing what just like you with the podcast i mean doing what you love and every day doesn't necessarily feel like work it's just it's just another day you know and, and it's enjoyable that's awesome you if i'm right too kelly you also get to judge the world goose calling championship out in eastern maryland Are you still involved yes. with that yeah absolutely so let's see i won the world in 99 and the champion of champions in 2000 right and the champion of champions of essentially just because of their rules it 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 basically you can't compete anymore in the world right so that happened fortunately for me really early in my calling career i kept contest calling through 2007 2008 i guess but uh, so e ever since 2001 i've been on the planning committee um and i've judged for I, oh goodness no telling how many years and been over been kind of in charge of help uh on the committee as far as getting judges and stuff like that uh, and kind of just helping the committee, you know, from afar, if I, I should say, um, you know, pr pr help produce that event. And, and I emceed it there for several years. Uh, so, you know, that, East, the town of Eastern Maryland and the Waterfowl Festival has been so good to me. And it's near and dear to my heart. So anytime I could give back, I, obviously, I, I look forward to doing that and helping out however I can. Oh, it's such a cool place. You know, I haven't I've been to Easton and the Waterfowlers Museum one time and i was i was a young man i think i was middle school aged we lived we lived so far away from it i mean <laughs> it was a long ways and now being in wyoming it's like got to jump on a plane to go go check that stuff out otherwise it's load the family in the minivan and it's a week to get there type thing but uh, yeah yeah what a cool little town um i gotta i gotta ask you does the is the tidewater in still in business Yes, actually they are. And, 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 you know, that's kind of their downtown. It's the center part of really everything. Uh, they right. use part of it for some, uh, for some meet and greets and for some art exhibits and stuff like that. But uh, it is still there. It's a, you know, it's, it's a, just a very unique, unique place, um, especially so, downtown. Yeah. So much history there. I, I gotta say when, when we went, we did kind of a family trip, like I said, back when I was a kid and my dad, I grew up as an avid waterfowler and wing shooter, and one of the one of the authors that my dad was infatuated with, and I have a deep love for, is Gene Hill. And Gene Hill wrote stories. One of the and I remember a couple times he wrote about the Tidewater Inn in Eastern Maryland, and boy, we just had to eat there. And man, the snapper soup is like I know it's got to <laughs> be it's amazing. I, I remember yeah. that stuff being incredible, but. Someday, someday I'm going to load everybody up and we're going to get out there again. Cause that oh, it's, it's, it's good. And believe it or not, you know, last year was the, uh, I mean, I've been going for goodness, what, 20 something years. And uh, it was um, the first year my family went this past year. Uh, of course, I, I've been wanting my wife and my kids to go. Uh, I have two kids, one five and one nine. And I've been wanting them to go, but man, in years past, it's so hard. If I'm affiliated with the contest or judging or MC. They would never see me. I mean, because literally sure. when I get on the ground on Thursday evening, it is, you know, come Friday morning at nine o'clock, go to the contest and start getting that going. And, you know, fortunately for me, you know, I would kind of just show up and, and help 
do my part when, when the true heroes are the guys that are on the ground there in Easton, you know, that really have done the legwork and, you know, I, I can only do so much from afar and, but the, those, those people there that, that help run the contest and the festival do so much time and, and they're, it's volunteer work. So, but with my family going this, this past year, um, the actual Teddy Hoover, which is now the festival, the contest chairman, um, he told me, he said, Hey, cause I wasn't, I wanted to take a year off from judging. And he said, will you still come, um, and, and, and bring your family. I want this year to bring your family. And man, that meant a lot to me. So it finally gave me a kind of a year off to, to uh, bring them. And we had a great time, man. I was able to share the, that whole town and the festival, uh, with my family and kind of show them around. So it, it was, it was a lot of fun. That sounds like it. That sounds like it. Yeah. I, that's definitely on the list for us. So I got, my kids are pretty small yet, and I got a third one. I got a little boy that's, man, any day. He could come literally any time now. And uh, I'm just excited for eventually in a few years down the road to be able to do, you know, go on the road and do stuff like that and, and take them places. Yeah, that's, Absolutely. That's so cool. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So where, where do you live right now? Where are you operating out of? So I, I live in uh, Buden City, Tennessee. It's the town I was born and raised in. I, I say this a thousand times. I was live here now. I was born here, and I hope I die here. It's just uh, such a great community. Uh, my family, we come from a farming background. So, uh, you know, we, uh, me and I have two older brothers, and we grew up, literally, I mean, with row crops, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, milo, and, and farming has kind of been in our DNA. Um, and we also do a little bit of excavation work. So we have a dozer and traco and dirt pans and that we use on the farm as well as, you know, growing up, we did some contract work and we literally would develop other hunting spots for other people and build levees and all that and shooting the grade and, and that whole everything around that. So from the conservation side, that's, I, 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 you know, growing up in a rural area, I mean, it's, it's just been a way of life for me and, that's why I've just been torn to this area. I mean, I, there's no way I would want to leave. I love it. You know, now granted, we'll be honest, you, you know, there's places that me and you're both fortunate to go and hunt that are probably way better hunting, you know, and, and certain times of the year, but man, nothing is, is any better than something close to your house. Uh, granted the hunting may not be as good, but it's home and I can be home with my family late that afternoon or just, you know, at, in the evening and sleep in my own bed. It means everything to me. That's so cool. That's so cool. You know, that, that reminds me, that reminds me of, of an Abraham Lincoln quote, and I'm not going to get all philosoph philosophical here, but I've got this, I've got this on the wall in my office and it says, I like to see a man proud of the place in which he lives. And I like to see a man live so that his place will be proud of him, Abraham yeah. Lincoln. And when you just said that, that quote just popped into my head because I think that's cool. I have bounced around all over the place. Um, mm -hmm home was kind of where I, wherever my goose calls hung, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm worried. We're in a place now here in North, Northwestern Wyoming, where I'm, I feel the exact same way about yeah. what you're talking about. I'm finally in a spot where it's like, this is home and this is where yeah. I, this is awesome. And, you know, grew up in Michigan and did that and whatever, moved around and got family all over the place. But yeah, I think I think having a place that you feel that strongly about, I think that that centers you, that grounds you, and you go. I think that allows you to take off for weeks at a time and go on hunts and do things. Oh, without a and doubt. The, yeah, knowing that you, that's home base, and you're going to come home to that. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and you nailed it. I mean, and goodness, man, we there's so much. And I tip my hat. I mean, a lot of times I look at different parts of the country thinking, man, I would, I'd love to live here. You know, and granted, they're beautiful scenery and all that. But, but the, the business side of things, when you have, especially when you have a family and kids and you have parents and grandparents and, you know, <laughs> that are here close and community uh, that helps lift you up in times and hardships. And, man, that is just so valuable. You know, you can't put a price tag on that. But, it's it's and, and that comes no matter where you move. I mean, that, there's no doubt that that comes in play when you get ingrained in the community and all that. And that's, I mean, goodness, here here I am tonight. We're you know I'm gonna go to my my nephew. He's got a just those things. Well, you're breaking up on me. Tell store, you know that we're we're still essentially mom and pop, even though we we have an e-commerce site and a catalog, but 
you know, we're still mom and pop. And I, I take pride in knowing, seeing so many, I mean, hundreds of people out in the community and know that guy, know what type bow he likes to shoot, know what firearm he likes, know where he hunts, know who's his friend. That's, man, that's, that's so much to me. And yeah, there's a, there's a certain type of relationship there that you don't get necessarily from just selling things over the phone or through website. Sure. You know, sure. That's a, you're a little, bro- you're, you're a little broken up, Kelly. You're a little broken oh, up. And I, I lost you completely there for a, for a second. Um, Go back. Yeah. What what were you talking? I think you're talking about your final flight outfitters. If I if I think and and your community involvement through them. Yes. Yeah, so so we do so much with our store at Final Flight. I mean, in the community, it's however we can give back. Uh, you know, and and your quote said it best. I mean, the the what we look at it is the more successful our community is through other businesses, the, then the more successful we are. So we, we try to promote our area, promote the real estate in our area, uh, promote the tourism, all of that. And it's a, it's a pretty valuable, uh, it's a win-win, I think, for all of us. Yeah, no, I completely, completely agree with you. That's one of the things that, that we try to do here as well is support the, support the local community and support you know, our local conservation efforts and, and organizations first and giving back to the community. Um, we had a situation last fall, it was... Uh, we had a young man starting quarterback for the football team, senior year, you know, things look great. And he got in a car accident the first oh. day of school and he's, he's paralyzed. He's paralyzed from his, pretty much from his waist down. Goodness. And man, did that rally the, this community, you know, and this yeah. is a, this is a town. Powell is a town of about 6,000 people, give or take. And yeah football team really they're always they're always good it's a solid program it's a great school system but they went from being you know we're going to be a good football team this year to uh runners up in the state championship yeah and that yeah. fire that 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 accident and the, this whole push for that young man just lit wow. the community up and it pushed those kids into a state championship game against a a powerhouse of a football team that they ended up, they ended up beating them, but yeah, it was still, it's kind of a Cinderella story, man. And I, I love, you don't get that in big cities as much, I think. And you get, when you, when you're invested in a small community and you're giving back, man, you're just tied to that stuff. And it's yeah, like, and it, I love it. You're yeah. And you're right. And I mean, and let's be honest a lot with, with your big city areas and you get a lot of, different crime, of course, the stuff that's going on in society now, you know, when you, when you know a person's heart and you know, you know, there's common ground. Now, granted, we may disagree on politics and stuff like that, but that's okay. You know, but we, we, we don't fight about it. You know, we, we love your neighbor and you, you know, and because you know where their heart is um, and, and you get in big cities and you don't, that, a lot of that's lost. You don't, that person, even though you might disagree with them, there's still a, you know, human being. And right, you know, sometimes right. people, I don't know, it's just a different, different, I lo- love small town community. It just, it's, it's very, very, has a lot of positives in it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't want to alienate anybody that, you know, that may live in the big city. Cause I know that there's communities within communities and in, in places, you know, in, and it's, and it's different, you know, there's neighborhoods and things like that. And I got a couple buddies that grew up in cities and they're like, Oh man, my neighborhood was so awesome. It was like this and that. And so, I mean, I think, but it's still that same idea of, You've got that core area, you know, yeah. you've got that, you're like that family group of honkers, man. This is where you live, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, yeah. and you're not, and this is home. That, yeah. that, that city park with the fountain, you know, where everybody's wearing a leg band is, uh, that's, that's home. <laughs> yeah. And for, and for me, it's, just, I mean, it's the same thing. And when, you know, raising a family and kids and it really, you know, it changes, it changes perspective. I know it did mine, you know, it different, just the way you look at things and, you know, and I, the, the saying goes, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And, 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 and like study that. show, even with kids, you know, there's a, there's a team of five, they say, you know, you're, there will be five people that will mold your children into the, you know, that, that, that helps them get through life outside of a family. So, you know, that team of five of who, who are, who are those individuals, you know? And so when you're in a community that, that you're, you're involved in heavily, 
then that not only helps you from a from a uh, spirituality standpoint and a mental health standpoint, but it also helps your children. Um, and it helps them grow into, you know, um, good people, you know, down the road and, and whatever type, type of business they get into. No, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, I, I look at, a, a, you know, I, I'm sitting here looking at your final flight outfitters page. It looks just like a cool little business, man, that you guys can, like you said, help people out and get into stuff. And I would imagine you've got some first time hunters walk through that door and you're able to hook them up with stuff or help them out with things and, and, oh, help, and help spread hunting, you know, and, and, uh, I think that's such a rewarding deal. If you get to help somebody get started, that'd be, that's really cool. Yeah. All the time. I mean, waterfowl hunters, and you know, of course, then again, a lot of our local, um, traffic, to be honest, I mean, man, we're, they're they're ingrained in it it's you know there it's so, because it's just such a a hunting environment you know, sure. you know. Uh, now granted we do have a lot of uh, people uh, out of town that if they're on the way to real foot lake which is a, a obviously a big waterfowl destination and we're right, right here beside or if they're going to arkansas or missouri we'll have a lot of people especially from the east northeast that come through um, and make a swing by the store pick up the gear they need and and get on their way so a lot of times you have a lot of new customers. Matter of fact, I had a friend of mine from Nashville last week called and they're going on a trip out West and, and on a duck hunt. And he's basically, he said, Hey, my buddy has nothing. He didn't need top of the line, but he just needs, you know, so Stop. we got him. Yeah. We got him a salesman off the, off the floor and, and basically walk through them. Now granted they could go to the website and buy what they want. But then again, just let's have a quick conversation and right. kind of see what they're looking for. And because you don't, I don't want to get them a bunch of just high end stuff if they can't use it in a byproduct somewhere else. You sure. Because they may only duck hunt once or twice, but then again, if I can get them some garments, maybe that's neutral colors, you know, that man, they're going to wear it to a football game. They're going to, you know, they're getting the best value. You bet. So, you bet. No, it's cool. You know, knowing you're being that personal touch, man, it kind of get, gets back to that. That's why I'm enjoying this podcast is, is yeah. I get to talk to so many different people from different areas of the country. And I, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we all have the shared love of hunting, waterfall hunting, especially. Right. That's and, right. and you, but everybody's got a little different experience. Everybody's got a little different take on things. You know, I, you know, talking to Sean, man, or I'm sorry, Sean Stahl the other day, it was, it was amazing how much, how many similarities to our stories we had part of it was because we grew up in Michigan and we hunted a lot of the same areas, but we had a lot of shared, shared history there that obviously we didn't know we had because we didn't know each other until just the other day. But right. now, now I'm sitting down and I get to talk with you and, you know, we're going to talk, we're going to start talking hunting here in a second and how you got started and how, and man, it's just so cool to find out where people came from, what, yeah. what their passions are, and I, I think it just, it helps build that, I guess you'd call it that brotherhood of hunters, whether you're a deer hunter, whether you're an elk hunter, big, you know, Western big game, whitetail, turkey guys, waterfowlers, upland, or you're like, I don't know if you're like me, you'll like, you love all of it, you know, and I love all of it. Yeah. waterfowl hunting is definitely near and dear to my heart, but I love all of it. You know, it's like yesterday and we're, we're big game Full, I'll go no stop on big game right now. Our waterfall seasons don't kick in really good until the end of November, January, December, January, February out here. And yeah. we all of September and October, man, we're chasing elk. We're chasing mule deer. We're chasing pronghorns, whatever we have tags for. Mm -hmm. And we took, I took off yesterday with, with the boss here, Ike Eastman. And we ran down to scout out a, a hunt camp location because he's got an elk tag not far from here. Oh, wow. And we had, we had to get camp, you know, get a spot for camp to get camp set up for those first couple weeks of September. And man, it's, it's next week, you know, it's like, we're going to be, we're going to be chasing bugles next week and yeah, just fuels my wow. fire. But how, how did you get, how did you get your start in hunting? Was it something your family, like you said, you're kind of ingrained in the culture, same where I grew up hunting was just oh, yeah. kind of an expectation. Go ahead. Yeah, so not, goodness, I'll go way back to even before I was born. I mean, my, my dad and my, even my grandfather. So the a particular piece of property that I even hunt now, my grandfather was lived on. Um, and, um, 
it, it, interesting. I have some barn wood in my house on the wall that were actually from cypress trees that were cut off of the bottom that I still hunt on today. Wow. So it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a, it, it, what I mean ingrained in DNA, it's, it goes pretty deep, but my grandfather was as a die in the wool duck hunter as you could possibly imagine. I mean, it was, you know, if there was a 60 day duck season, he was there every single day. And this goes back in the, you know, thirties, forties and fifties. And just, I mean, it was, that's what he did every day. And, you know, we, we did a lot of row crops. So we had corn and soybeans and all that, but we also back then, and, and of course this is way before I was born. We had, uh, we had a lot of dairy cows and uh, the story goes as my, my grandfather's kind of, it's a local legend, I guess, but uh, my during duck season, my grandmother she milked the cows every day, and that was that <laughs> just what what she did. You know, the, sure. the whole family chipped in. Well, you can see where this is going. On about day fifty, he comes in at dark, and she's madder than a hornet, and basically <laughs> gives she gives him the ultimatum. She says, "Listen, I know you love duck hunting, but I'm tired of milking these cows by myself. You're either going to have to you're going to have to come start helping me some days, or we got to get we got to do something else and get rid of these cows or something." And, I mean, he instantly responded, call the auctioneer. And nice. literally, I mean, like three weeks later, every head of cattle we sold, and we have never been in the dairy cattle business ever since that day. Because so, of duck hunting. Because of duck <laughs> I love hunting. it. I love yeah. it. So, and so that's, I mean, that happened way before my time. And then, you know, my father comes along and, and, and he was born on the property that we hunt on. And, and of course, there's not even a house there anymore. It's just an, just an old little, you can tell the remnants of an, maybe a, an old lot there, but it, it's just right on the edge of a bottom, a big flat that the river would get out every fall seasonally. And, uh, but anyway, so growing up with me, I mean, ever since I could walk, I've been involved in hunting. Um, you know, some of the earliest memories of going with my dad, uh, goose hunting back when we used to get tons of Canada geese. And unfortunately we don't get them much anymore, but, uh, he gave me a little, I had a little red goose call. Um, and, uh, I would run back behind the house in November, December, and man, the huge flocks of migratory geese back then were just massive, you know, cause real foot late back then, I mean, we would winter, yeah. you know, around 150,000 Canada geese that would right. be, you know, uncommon at all. And, and they would go all the way down to Wheeler Lake, Alabama, Northern. I mean, it was, it was common. Um, and that's where I got my passion of, of calling. And, and that's probably when I was, I guess, six, seven years old. Uh, and then started going from there and, and hunting with my brothers when I was nine and 10. And man, when I started, um, I know when I started high school, you know, going, I mean, with us every day, I could, I could be in the duck blind and leave the duck blind at seven 30 and be at school at seven 45, seven 50. Um, so, you know, once I started driving, I got a, a permit at when I was 15 years old. You know, you, you duck hunted every single day of season. I mean, you didn't, and listen, if you missed a day or you wanted to sleep in, like it was a sin. I mean, it was almost <laughs> like you, you know, my brothers and my brother's friends, I mean, they would haze you for it. I mean, you did not miss a day. So literally I would go at 7.30 and, and get to school at 7.45, walk into high school. Of course, I would take my outer camo off and just walk in, you know, whatever. And and then at, at three o'clock, I was running back to the truck and going right back to the duck blind. I mean, you did that for 60 days. That's just, that's what you did. It was a way of life. Um, and, and I'll never forget. I mean, of course now, goodness, you know, since you couldn't, I, I remember locally our schools with zero tolerance. I mean, we had the, I, I remember our principal, we had an assembly and he literally singled me out in front of the whole student body. He's basically said, this is the whole no firearms on campus rule, you know? And uh -huh. he said, all right, now you duck hunters, powers, <laughs> He said, just leave your shotgun in the duck blind. It's okay. You'll get back to it when you get after school, <laughs> you know, because I mean, you know, you would just, I mean, I'd throw my shotguns in the back of the truck. And right. You, just, you never thought anything about it. Well, goodness, you do it now. I mean, it's a completely different environment. Oh, and I, man. I see it, you know, but back then it was just, hey, this, I'm going duck hunting, you know, and, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's how I got started. And, and really my, my older brothers is one that really kind of driven me um and that and and pushed me because they were that's kind of the direct we were, we were so close and still are today you know um but it went from there it went from high school on up to when i was when i was a senior in high school um i went to my parents and I, i'll never forget it was 10 o'clock at night and of course they were fixing to go to bed and i was going to bed and i went up to their room and 
dad's watching the the channel six news it's our local nbc affiliate out of paducah kentucky but they were watching that and i just said you know i got a crazy idea but i wanted to get involved in contest calling which was a pipe dream you know and i said but the reason i want to for some reason if i could win a big contest let's just hypothetically say i could win the world (laughs) you know and and literally in 1998 i had this or 1997 i had this conversation with them I said, if I could win the world, goodness, like maybe that'll help my resume to where I could work in the outdoor industry because that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to do something in the outdoor industry, whether it was a, a factory rep and outdoor anything. And uh, of course, I'm sure my parents thought it was crazy at the time. And and here it was in 1999, you know, a year and a half later, I won the world. And ever since then, it's just been accelerated. And uh, some crazy pipe dream turned into, you know, I mean, I just, you stay focused and, 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 and honestly, like I said, show me your friends. So your, I'll show you your future. I fortunately had good friends and guys that pushed me and that were like-minded and, you know, and, and the whole, whole calling contest, uh, uh, community, it, whole calling contest community was, is close knit, you know, and good friends of mine. And I know you just did a podcast with Sean Stahl and goodness, he's a dear friend too. You know, uh, we don't, our paths don't cross as much anymore, but we definitely stay in contact when we can. That's so but that's cool. My, that's my story. I mean, that's kind of uh, kind of how it went. I won the world in 99. I won the champion of champions in 2000. And then after that, I kind of set a goal of wanting to win a lot of the big contests. And, and um, you know, I, I won the U.S. Open, the North American Masters, the World Open. Basically, kind of, I just kind of won that. I guess if you were to name the top 10 or 12 or 15, you know, I kind of check those off the box and, you know, I just, I, I loved it. And I, I, one of the last contests I competed in a lot of, was, was the worldwide. I think it was in 2000 and let's see, it was 2005. Um, and, and, you know, it was several years kind of, kind of quit call a little bit, but come back and, and was able to win that one. And, and ever since then, I just, just didn't have the heart as much anymore, not the, just the practice in part, because all, obviously contest calling is a, yes, there's a skill there, but there's so much mental that goes behind it that you have to be in the right mental state to where not many people, I don't necessarily get that, you know, as much. And for me, it was, it, it was, it was a struggle to be mentally prepared for these contests after, after several years. And I just, you know, it just got routine and, Anyway, I, I I remember the worldwide. It was going into the final round, and here I was. I looked down. I was sitting in the back room, and I obviously made the top five. So I'm sitting there, and I looked down, and I got on a pair of old hunting pants that had blood on it from that day, and like <laughs> you know, and and a uh, pullover, and I'm like, what am I doing here? Like I could care less, but at a calling contest, but here's an opportunity at that time, and it paid fifteen grand for first place. And I'm like, sure, here's an opportunity that I could win the largest payout in a calling contest history. And I have been just going through the motions in these first two rounds. Like, what am I doing? And, 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 it, and that was a reality check for me. And fortunately for me, I absolutely kicked it in the high gear and just crushed the last round because I mentally got back in the game. Right. But ever since then, I'm just like, man, this is, it's just not, this, it's just a different feeling, you know? And, and uh, so, and, and everybody, everybody gets that. They, they understand that. I'm sure. Man, that's cool. So you, you, I mean, obviously extremely accomplished contest caller. When, when was it that you got hooked up with the whole, with Tim grounds? Because if if, if, if I remember correctly, you had, you and Tim worked together on, on, on some calls. If I remember correctly. Absolutely. So um, we, 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 I met Tim actually at Real Foot Lake probably when I was a sophomore, junior, and no, I guess when I was a junior in high school. Wow. Um, and which would have been in '95, and so I met him there, and just in passing, and got a call from him, and uh, the when I was a senior in high school, actually, this is crazy. I took a, I took a, a in quotes a college visit in in December in Southern Illinois, which. I visited, you know, SIU, and the main reason is because I went goose hunting, you know, so I went up there to, to visit the campus, and, and in between visiting the campus, I hung out in the goose pit for a little while, but um, but while I was up there, I had some good friends of mine and ended up uh, 
I got it up there my uh, freshman year of college when I, I ended up going to college here at University of Tennessee at Martin. But uh, I, uh, I got it up there for a season while I was off for college break uh, and kind of got to know Tim just a little uh, uh, better then uh, as well. But before that, um, before that, when I, when I really got to know him is, is right before, I guess, my in between, let's see, the summer of 97, I started contest calling. Uh, all right. And then met Tim, started blowing his calls. I, I actually started off with the guy's best, a flute, just like Sean Stahl did. Same thing. Right. You know, we, we were flute guys that started off. Uh, Sean did be- way better. I think than everybody than was a flute guy there for a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Sean did way better than, than I did, you know. And uh, um, anyway, he, um, uh, we went in and uh, then in 98. Uh, I went to the world in Eastern Maryland, and man, I just got killed. I mean, I think I was in the bottom five or something. And then I realized that uh, I needed. I saw some guys doing some things on a short read that that I felt like I could do, um, you know, as well. And so I went in and just changed my uh, um, changed my whole routine, switched over to a short read style. Uh, I thought, goodness, because that's what I felt comfortable with, and. Uh, um, when I did that, uh, you know, that, that's kind of what launched everything. I mean, I come back and wrote my routine out on paper. Uh, I, I come from a kind of a musical background. I, I was big in percussion uh, growing okay. up and love love drums, you know, and, and that's kind of where my whole. So I, I, I've always thought that even contest calling, there's a missing void there because at the end of the day, it's music that you're doing. Right. There, there's a the lack of standardization of what notes are is a missing void that that you know, someone could put down some time to it. I mean, we can physically write routines down on paper, just like I'm reading sheet music, playing the piano or, or, or a sure. saxophone, whatever, you know, and, but contest calling or calling for any, any matter, there's just that, there's a, a lack of a standardization, but anyway, going back to not, not to get off on that hope, that's a whole other topic, but uh, <laughs> I met, I met Tim, you know, that really in, in 98 officially, I mean, I met him earlier, but really got to know him, started doing calling contests and then, uh, after the first year at the world, when I switched and started doing a short read, you know, the goodness, I think the first contest I went to, I come in either first or second. And then after that, I started when I won a big contest in Kansas City and this and that. And I wasn't going to go back to the world. And for some reason, Tim got in touch with my dad and convinced, tried to convince me to go. And my dad's up to then has never been to a contest. But he said, if you go, I'll pay for your ticket. You know, and, and of course, then, goodness, I was, you know, just like any college kid, right. struggling, scratching pennies and whatever. He said, but if you go, I'll pay the ticket and, and I'll go with you. And cool. uh, and that was a year I won. And, and of course, then, man, it, of course, I was friends with Tim before that, but it really, it really helped, obviously, my career and, and, and great. I can't imagine, I mean, just the friendship that we shared and not only that, but just the, the whole contest scene helped launch a career for me that i mean i've been fortunate to talk and hunt with so many just icons in the industry that i looked up to you know and tim was being one of them and i know it's sad to say you always hear the saying you don't know what you oh you cut out on me again i look back at it and it just the thoughts of how much how much stuff that I learned from him indirectly that you don't realize that you learned, you know, sure, um, sure. and, and we were filming in Canada with Higdon and they asked some comments and, you know, and I'm not a big person to say things kind of on the air, you know, it's just, just not necessarily my style, but privately I was saying to Kurt, our producer, I was like, you know, the, he was asking if I wanted to say some stuff and, and we did just a little thing, but, I said, what what I really think of is I'm driving in this field. I look at that big hilltop out there. I mean, Tim used to love hunting those hilltops. And I look at the way he's putting decoys. So Tim would used to like to set stuff up like this. And he was very aggressive hunter, very aggressive calling style. That's just kind of how he, you know, what he figured out that worked. And and obviously the the results don't lie. Right. You know, those things like that struck up a a friendship with him. You you don't realize those things until someone's gone and it's just – Anyway, but that's that's kind of our, our story there with with me and Tim and, oh, and the cool. friendship we had. That is that's cool. Yeah, you know, kind of. I it sounds like you and I are about the same age. To be real honest with you, you're talking about '98. You know, being in college, and I, that was me too. I mean, I, I graduated high school in '96, and oh, 
was doing kind of kind of the same thing. You know, I was following you guys and what was going on there. And of course, I was way the heck up in northern Michigan on lakes, living on Lake Superior, and I was so busy chasing geese and and ducks and other stuff that you know. And well, yeah, I would. I mean, goodness gracious, anything contest related for 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 us was so far away. Yeah. Um, it was unbelievable, but yeah, I got to, got to watch you guys do that and started with that, with that Tim grounds, uh, half breed goose talk, short yep. read man alive, oh, you know, and, and went from there and have owned a pile of different calls, but that kind of takes me to, you know, where you are now with, with power calls. Yeah. Because for a while you, you and Tim collaborated on some calls and you, you had, a, I think there was a Kelly power signature series, everything yep. now, but now you have. Your own line, and you guys do duck, goose, turkey, elk, all kinds of stuff. We how, do. How did how did that come about? Well, John and Ben Higdon, which I, I've worked for the guys at Higdon Decoys for goodness ten years, I guess. Okay. Uh, and for years they were like Kelly, you ought to do something. You ought to do something. You know. Uh, at the time, I didn't know where Tim was going to go with his business because, at the end of the day, man, I. I the, the dollars and cents side of it, I mean, I just like to produce a good product and be with it, whoever it was. And, and I'm, I'm not necessarily, a, I don't want to say I didn't want to, it's not a jumping ship by any means because it, it was a, I'll tell you this, to be perfect, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, you know, because Tim was so good to me. Sure. I didn't, it was more like, you know, even when I was with him, we both did a collaboration with Rich and Tone. You know, I helped get them started right. in the goose call thing and, and then they kind of helped Tim do a competition duck call. So we kind of did that deal, you know, and when I started with the power calls, it was a tough, it was a tough deal. And probably more honestly was for Hunter because Hunter was kind of like a brother to me. I mean, goodness, I remember when Hunter was a kid, you know, and, and right. me and Tim shared conversations and I told him, I said, listen, I'll go to my grave that, that, that anything Hunter, I mean, I'll, I'd help Hunter anything in the world. I just, I, thank in the world for him and and the the thing is that with with Tim's business Tim was so hands on and it's just his nature there's nothing wrong with this he was so hands on and and Hunter come around and and started just becoming a nightmare on the stage like he was like just unbelievably talented you know right. and and does all the accomplishments that he does Tim really needed to kind of transition the tide a little more to Hunter. I felt like with their business and, sure. and, and he started doing that. And, you know, me looking in, I'm kind of in the middle here. I'm just, you know, <laughs> they were almost, I mean, they're like family to me, but it's kind of like, Hey man, I, I really, this needs to be Hunter in this limelight, you know? And, and now I, I really would feel like Tim would be proud with what Hunter's done, you know, because at the end of the day, do we both make calls? Yes. Are we competitors? Well, technically, yes. Right. But man, right. this industry is so small, man. I, I mean, the stuff they make is so stinking good. If if somebody comes to me and wants a recommendation, like lay the calls out there. If they find something, I just feel like what you're comfortable with. I'll tune it however you want it tuned. If it's your heart, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the brand, you know. Just to make you know somebody happy. Um, so. But so starting power calls was obviously a difficult decision for me working with the Higdons. You know, it, it was a it, it was a good opportunity. And the reason the main reason I did it and and I told John and Ben, I said, if we want to do this, I've got to do something different. And, and they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I, I, I want to do a friend of mine worked with NASCAR at the time and carbon fiber was coming around. I said, like, I would really like to experiment with carbon fiber. Sure. Uh, as a material never been done before from a from, from a hand laid carbon fiber and, and calls and then also i want to want to look at the actual engine of the call the guts i want to make them out of a harder material like a titanium uh, and honestly it's so far-fetched i thought there's no way we can pull this off and we went through several different suppliers and we've got a mechanical engineer that's just unbelievable where we can and we have a 3d printer in house so we could really have a design he could draw it up in cad we could print it right there while I'm eating lunch, watching it printed on a 3D printer. <laughs> and then just in an hour, I've got a working prototype. Well, then we could send it off to our factory to get quotes for carbon fiber, this, you know, out of the same design. That's how it all started, you know, and it just got to be really cool and it got to be different. And that, that's what I said. I, that's what I want to be known for, you know, is, is, is that, because at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do with, you know, a goose call 14,000 mile R thickness read, you know, a tone board, a wedge block, you know, a barrel and an insert. There's only so much 
really that you can do from a ge- geometry standpoint, geometric standpoint, and a and a, the physics behind it. There's just not a lot of stuff unless you really start getting innovative with different materials. Sure. And that's where we wanted to be known for. And I said that that to me, I want to be as the Lexus kind of that high end premium line. And so that's how Power Calls was born. That's kind of how it got started. Um, you know, and now since then we do offer you know different. Uh, regular acrylic versions and regular poly versions and stuff like that. Uh, but that's kind of what we're known for is that high end premium, premium line. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember when, when you first started hitting the market with those, I was, I, like you said, I'd never seen anything like that. You know, everything's been acrylic was the rage for quite a while. And I always run, you know, I usually have a run in like an acrylic and a wood, uh-huh. you know, just for different tones yep. on my lanyard, different days. And, but I'm on. I, I remember, never forget. I saw your calls and this these carbon fiber with titanium guts and all this. And I'm going, wow, that's cool. That is way yeah. different than anything out there. I yeah. I think it's I think it's great. I think that having that vision is. I mean, because you're right. You can't. There's there's a, always room for innovation. There's always room for improvement. But at the same time. You can only you can you can only improve the same thing so many times before you've got to go back to the drawing board completely. Uh, yeah, and that and that's what got it did it for for me. It's just the it, it was fun because we could design. I'm not going to draw it out on a sheet of paper and help help Jesse, our mechanical engineer, lay it out in CAD and 3D print it. And then you have the media side of it that we have our media firm in house, and I could walk across the the hall and do the videos of it on a, on a green screen or a white backdrop. I mean, it was just crazy. The talent that was there. I was like, man, this is, this is fun. It was kind of easy, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, but it, it made a good product too for the consumer. And at the end of the day, I said, you know, somebody may not like, like our calls, but that's fine. I mean, that's, you know, I'm sure there's people that don't and they have no problem with that because, but at the end of the day, I want them to say, well, you know what? They, they were innovative. They were different. They were innovative. You know, he did this and that. And that, that's to me, that's like, okay, we've arrived. You know, um, if we're innovative and have that, well, then that's fine. Because tuning goose calls, listen, I can tune 10 goose calls and you have 10 customers and all 10 of them are going to like something different. And that's right. just a fact. That's a fact. And which it was, a, which is a hurdle in itself. You know, I tell guys, if you, if you want to buy a high end call, if you could ever try one in person, especially if you catch one of us at a show, that is the best way to do it because everybody presents air differently into a call. Um, sure. It's just, you know, and, and everybody has things that they think they like because of a kind of a preconceived notion of I've been blowing this for 10 years and it's just the muscle memory of what you're used to, you know, but then if you start blowing a different call that has a different air presentation, different, you force yourself, well then after a month or so you pick your other one up. You're like, Ooh, what did I like about that one? You know, right, right. So it's just it's that muscle memory and what your what your brain's triggering and telling yourself. And so, but at the end of the day, we try to tune most of our calls fairly average, and then you just kind of got to roll the punches and and see what people like and, and 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 go from there. No, yeah, it's. I remember, I, I'm trying to remember when I I had to kind of force myself learn how to tune a call because I was I don't remember how exactly it happened, but one of the first short reads I had uh, came apart on me and yeah. slipped out and it fell apart in the, in the blind. And I'm like, uh, okay. So I ripped my other, I got two of them. I ripped the other one out and I'm looking at the call, the read in the tone board set. And I'm going, okay. So I start fiddling with it in the field and totally found oh, a different yeah. way to tune my calls. And I just stumbled on it and you know, I've tweaked it and done different things here and there. And I'm by no means, a, a calling expert or or a tuning expert but you know you find what works for you like you said and it's it's interesting but i i you know and now i carry a, a kit i carry an extra read i carry yep. some some extra components because if i am out there and something happens i got to be able to you know i, I got to be able to fix it in the absolutely field. and when I, when honestly I, when that's I, one of the reasons i carry multiple calls too yeah, when I was a kid, I, I, I goodness, I think I was eight or nine, and, and my older brother had a goose call that he loved. And of course, first thing I did is take it apart. Oh, <laughs> he was he was so hot with me, and back, but my whole 
I said, listen, if a human put it together, then a human could put it back together. Right. This is not machine made in a, some sense. It's assembled by a person. So, you know, granted, at that time, I couldn't get it back like he liked it. I mean, it was a struggle. Sure. But what, what happened to me, I was just fascinated with the physics behind how air travels through a, a car. You know, and, and when you bend a reed or when you shave here on the top or when you shave on the sides or when you do this or do that, and like what that does, what that does to that air as it travels through that object. And that's like, to me, I mean, friends of mine were going on weekends and hanging out with others. I was at home with a magnifying glass and, <laughs> and looking at guts and studying. And like, I was just so fascinated with all of that, you know? And I mean, that's, I mean, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I was eat up with it. And that's what I did for goodness for so long and I, even during my contest days you know with everything i mean i nobody touched my calls i mean it was if, and, and my college roommate at the time and i even told him if, if the house catches on fire you grab one call and <laughs> one set of guts and let everything else burn like do not you know yep um, yep i always so, said that i always said that blowing another man's calls like kissing his wife oh you, yeah you yeah. darn sure better have permission to pull that off <laughs> Yes, exactly. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't happening with me, that's for sure. No, I hear you. I hear you. Those things are like sacred, you know. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's that's really cool and really interesting to, to kind of hear how, how you got that start because, like I said, I remember when I first saw those power calls, I went, wow, those are really different. I've never seen anything quite like those. That's really cool. Someday I'd like to hear the story behind that. Well, Thank yeah, you. well, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and I would be doing a disservice if I didn't go into this. So, you know, I started off this whole podcast as saying, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And kind of, I would love if I come up with that quote, but it's been out for, for decades. Sure, sure. But with our company and Power Calls, like, there is no way, you know, we have on staff, Brooke Richard, which is from Lafayette, Louisiana. He helps, Brooke helps design our spec calls. He's an unbelievable spec guy. Um, and that's where he's from. He's, he, he, they, they live and breathe spec hunting, sure. you know, uh, and also duck calling. He's an unbelievable duck caller. He, he won the world live team uh, event in Maryland, I think three years ago. Wow. Um, so he helped design our, uh, a lot of our duck calls, our cut down duck call that then you've got Kyle Jones, which Kyle, goodness, I knew Kyle when he was, you know, won the junior world. And then we, he was at a NWTF show about, four years ago, three years ago. And uh, basically we wanted to see if he wanted to come work for us. And Kyle literally left Michigan, uprooted him and his fiance. Now they live in Paducah, Kentucky. Wow. And Kyle was wanting to get back into contest calling. And I, you know, he kind of asked if I would help. And, and I told him this, I said, listen, I'm going to, if you want to do this, I'm going to be very hard on you, but keep in mind, like this is a team just because if I say something to recommend something it doesn't mean it's the gospel but I, I can tell you this Kyle if I was coming out of retirement today I would want you pushing me the same way I'm going to push you you know and and we we did that and and goodness Kyle won the world the last two years in a row wow and absolutely just a dominant force and you know I, I take pride in it because I I kind of know the prescription, you know, it's been, it's been, that contest has been good to me and seeing and helping other guys go and win. And I, I just, I love being in the background and watching them succeed. And Kyle is no different. He's just a great guy, humble person. He's so huge for the industry. But so Kyle helps us design not only our duck calls with Brooke, but he's also huge and, and goose call design. And, and then lastly, uh, Bo Brooks and Bo is huge in the Turkey call and the elk world. You know, and Bo has been working with us now for two years, and he does all of our uh, elk calls. He does all of our turkey calls, uh, and so he's probably one of the most well-rounded, talented guys from a contest calling standpoint. From from deer to elk to turkey, like I, I don't, I can't think of anybody any better than him. When you take in consideration every species, like wow. he is un unreal. But those three guys, from a calling standpoint, they are power calls. Yes, my, my name is on some of the premium packaging and I, you know that, but listen, they make me look good. And, mm -hmm. and I, I always say this to them, give, put talented people in areas where they can succeed and give them space and they do great things. And Kyle, Brooke and Bo are absolutely just phenomenal. That's and I'm, cool. I mean, I'm, I'm so blessed to call them friends, but at the end of the day, I'm just like, they'll say, Hey, what about doing this? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't, 
you know, I may disagree with them on some things, but a lot of times they're probably right, you know, and they, they're just super talented. So if, if we got to talk about power calls, we have to talk about those guys. And, and even, even the team of our mechanical engineer, Jesse, that works with us. I mean, he is goodness. He's the guy that the unsung hero that actually enters designs and CAD that you never really see, but he, he does things that are just blows you away. And we were, we were talking about the carbon fiber route and for years, you know, with goose guts, I want a material that is super hard, that it's going to have a quick read response. You know, ABS plastic and polycarbonate, sometimes it, it's got a little bit of, it's a softer compared to, you know, a brass or compared to aluminum or compared to a titanium. And I explained this to Jesse from a, a hunting term standpoint uh, and, and what I'm looking for. And he comes back with this whole form, mathematical formula explaining <laughs> the the density of item of, of materials and why it's doing what it's doing and i literally stop i mean he literally he has a whiteboard a, a dry erase board and he's writing all this stuff down and i stop him i was like jesse we need to film this like this is brilliant like you're literally everything you're saying mathematically completely adds up to what we're experiencing in the field when we blow a wood goose call or blow a acrylic call or a whatever Right. And so we did one of our first promo videos has him on there explaining this, you know, and like just it, he has to dumb it down for me a lot of times right. and really, really go slow. But no, he's just very talented. Oh, that is cool. That sounds like a heck of a team you got. It just, you know, I, I, I agree. You surround yourself with talented people and get out of their way. You know, that's, it. I, that's so yeah. much of what we do here, too, at, at Eastman's, you know, because Wingman's me and a couple other dudes and you know we're making it happen as we're a part of other things but same deal man um i was actually that was part of the truck conversation yesterday down to find that elk hunting camp spot was talking about the team that we have currently here and how that team is what makes us successful and that that, that it's 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 incredible everybody's got their part everybody's good at something and they, we work as a team, and the next thing you know, we've got this awesome end product and end result. And it's like, man, how do we even get here? Well, it wasn't an accident. There was a plan. There was a design. But everybody yeah. plays a part, and the next thing you know, you're you've got so you're sitting at staring at yeah. success. And I've I've used I've used this term with our guys. You know, you stay in your lane and and own it. You know, and and recognize and identify what you're good at. You know, we all have different talents. And for me personally, like, you know, sales is a weakness. You know, I'm, I'm more of a guy that I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, incognito a little bit. I like to be in the sidelines and, and, and just a more of a shy, quiet personality. Sometimes it may come off as standoffish to people and it's sure completely not the case. It's just, I'm just kind of shy and don't, you know, I just like to be in the background and, and kind of live a private life. You know, and so sales was tough for me. I, I just, I'm not a good salesman and my guys know it. They, sometimes they call me the grunt or, or the, or the grouch. I'm just, I'm getting old. <laughs> my lady, they say it. I don't do, I don't do the social media scene. That's just not me. I just, you know, and, and they're opposite. They do well there, but I tell them, I said, you know, it's, it's a, a good football team. You've got your, your great big lineman and you got your running backs and you got your quarterback. Well, you know, that lineman can't do the job that the quarterback does, but that quarterback can't do the job that the lineman do. But when you put them together, they have an unstoppable force. Right. You know, and I said, so if we identify what God gave us a, as a skill to be good at, and we stay in that lane and we own that lane, then when we work together, it's an unstoppable force. And, you know, a lot of that you're seeing, I think, with Kyle on the goose calling circuit, he is he's he's doing things that he's best with. And he he takes, you know, some advice from me and from others. And he he puts his stamp on it um, and he has the drive, you know, to do that. And, man, it's it's a powerful team. And like I said, I told him if I was coming out of retirement, I would want an accountability partner to hold me accountable to practice, to hold me accountable, to do these new style notes and, and, and to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Sure. Um, and, and that's when you have teams like that, man, that's, that's a tough, that's, that's somebody tough to beat, especially on stage or in, in business and stuff like that. So extremely blessed. Yeah. Fruits of the spirit, man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Goodness. <laughs> that's right. Goodness. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to transition. I've loved what we've been talking about so far, but we haven't gotten to talk hunting hardly one yeah. leg so let's let's dive into that what what do you got for this fall what what's coming up for you 
you know, I know we're co- gonna be- COVID has COVID's like, I mean, everybody talks about this, but literally everybody's plans got shattered back in April, you know, right. and, and the way things are right now, you, you don't know, but I mean, like you were saying, you got some local stuff. We could still drive around and travel. I mean, what's that look like this year? Yeah. So, you know, for me, fortunately, we, I have some, we have a, uh, we, we have our, our fields and stuff that we farm here in Tennessee. And I've got some hunting spots just in Kentucky. I'm right on the line of Kentucky and Missouri. Sure, sure. So, so we hunt in Kentucky and Missouri as well. And I can be any of the spots in, you know, 45 minutes or up to an, within an hour. Uh, but most of my stuff I'm hunting within just a few miles of my house. So it's uh, that we do. We actually, uh, oh, goodness, I can't tell you. It's, uh, let's see, this, just this week, let's see, we, we, I sprayed some millet. Uh, we had a top dress millet. We planted about 30, about 30 acres of millet. We had some corn that we lost due to flooding. So we come back in and, and, and went in and broadcast a bunch of millet. And so I sprayed it for broadleaves this week. Uh, also some of our timber hose around the edge is growing up with grass. So I'm trying to, I like, I like really big proponent of the way things look from the air. Um, and, and for us, we don't have the millions of ducks like we used to get like some of the places get in Northern Missouri and all that. So, you know, we got to have some of these spots, man, we have to micromanage really well to have them really inviting because a lot of our days we're hunting traffic. We're not hunting ducks that have been sitting on us for three weeks, you know? Sure. Uh, sure. So but anyway, I spray along the edge of our timber hose just to knock back some of that grass that's grown up. I want it to be water going into trees, you know, and, and I don't mind buck brush, but I don't really like the grass because it covers up visibility from the air on, on our water and, and I want our decoys to be seen uh, and this and that. So yeah, that's just this week. Let's see. I spray goodness. I bet I sprayed for hours on Monday and then I went back <laughs> in Tuesday with a tractor and, and top and sprayed our millet. Uh, and now with hurricane coming, we're looking at getting several inches of rain here tonight, and tomorrow. So that's another hurdle to, to overcome. Um, next week I've got, to, I'll be in, Missouri, we're doing some dirt work on a farm. We flood probably, it's about 300 acres of water, but but we're wanting to raise a levee up probably about five or six inches. And uh, really minor, I, you know, if we can raise that up, that'll actually help push a lot more sheet water out and we're going to move a pit location. So that's on the job for next week. Um, and then after that, it's back here in Tennessee working on another blind that we got to do, uh, planting some trees around it. And we, we had some trees that died and we got to have more of a tile point. So I got to sink some telephone poles and concrete and cut them off and have some tile points. So the blind don't float away in the case of a high water event yeah. down the road. So it never ends. It's just a, it's another day. And, you know, uh, just depends on what time of the year it is. And, um, what, one of our, we had a big blind, a big floating blind that we put on the Mississippi river that I took out at the end of this year. And we did spray insulation and it, uh, welded, welded, uh, drain hose on it so I can drain water, welded shooting stalls on the top, uh, all kind. I mean, it was a, a full week in the shop with the welding machine and getting that, getting that done and then painting it. And, and so, yeah, but all that's, it's just like I say, it's, it's, it's another day, another job. And yes, a lot of these things we could overlook and just go hunting, but that's just not my nature, man. I'm constantly like, during the season, I have a note in my phone that is a to-do list for all season. And I may look down at the blind and think, huh, we could use a shelf there. We could do, and I just, every day I'm just constantly writing things in my phone as a note so I can, so I don't forget it with my, my aging memory. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but yeah, so that, so that's what I do. And I go with off season and we get the guys together and we just start plugging away at all these things. And every year is better than the previous year. No, oh, that's cool. That is cool. Yeah, that local that local game is important. You know, we're not we're kind of in the same boat. We're close to Montana here. We can be up in Montana in probably thirty minutes from yeah. from the off from the office here. So try to hunt some up there. Try to hunt. I've got one of the guys from the offices. Dan Picard is up filming an antelope hunt in Montana right now, and he's sending me pictures of all the the sloughs and ponds around where he's hunting and they're just loaded with ducks just loaded with ducks and we won't get to touch them until montana opens the same time we do on october 3rd and i'm you know i'm I'm thinking okay how do i get a how do i 
finagle a cameraman and a camera and some equipment away from the big game guys <laughs> so yeah. i can go film an opening day duck hunt someplace and if it works great if it doesn't you know um probably still get out and hunt that do that local stuff but um that's cool yeah i mean i canada's out you know we didn't i we had got some stuff on the horizon coming here and there but as i'm sure you do but that local scene is that's pretty big for us we we stay oh, yeah. pre- we stay pretty tight we've got good hunting here and uh we're blessed you know we're blessed to have what we have and and like you kind of making the most of it you know getting getting decoys around and getting stuff ready to go and making sure the blinds are set up and when that grass turns brown we'll be out cutting grass for our a-frame blinds you know and yeah and just lots of stuff that goes into it but it's a labor of love that's right now we will with with higdon with our tv show we do have some uh, I think we're going to plan on doing some stuff out west a little more this year. Cool. Uh, and and now granted, then again with the COVID stuff, a lot of this is tentative. But obviously, Canada is something you just kind of, you know, you just kind of we eliminate that. Obviously, that's right. Let's check that off the list. And so, uh, fortunately for us, we do have we're we're sitting on several episodes that we had from last year that we haven't aired, so we're we're in pretty good shape. But but we will do obviously some probably some stuff out west and then. Uh, do some stuff here locally and then do some stuff in northern Missouri um, and uh, with our, uh, you know, with our Momarsh guys. Right. So, right. yeah, that's that's uh, that's kind of tempting plan. And, and Kyle may Kyle still want to go up to Michigan and do some goose hunting. So he may twist more. We may go up there. And do there you go. I, I don't, yeah. So uh, but that that would be cool. But outside of that, it's just kind of a wait and see. You know, I don't. Goodness, who knows what? I, I mean, everybody. I don't think anybody knows the right thing to do, but it's okay. I mean, we just we all kind of just winging it together, and uh, I don't know. It's a scary times, but then again, we're we're gonna get through it. Oh yeah, no, I completely agree with you. But we're we're kind of sitting in the same boat. I've got, you know, with, with the YouTube channel and webisodes that we do, I'm sitting on content from last year that we haven't cut yet. You know, haven't haven't done anything with. So it's like, yeah, let's let's play it by ear and take advantage of the opportunities as they arise. And if we can get, you know, if we can make a run to someplace, let's do it. But absolutely. Yeah. yeah, No, it's, uh, I hear you. It's definitely one of those things, but if you had, you find yourself out this way and you want to jump in a goose pit or duck blind, give me a holler. (laughs) Yeah. I appreciate (laughs) it. There'll be, there'll be, there'll definitely be, be openings for, for lots of, lots of folks. So. You know, we hunted. Uh, actually, me and Grounds went to Torrington, uh, yeah. Wyoming, and the the one the two goose shoot, I believe. Yep. Uh, back in oh my goodness, two thousand and three, two thousand and four. Uh, me, let's say me and him. I know Kevin Gross was out there. Uh, you know, he was a pitcher with the Dodgers, and then I right. think John. Va- I think John Vaca was out there. I don't know if John was there or not that trip. Okay. Uh, but that was a good time. It's a pretty pretty area. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, I haven't, haven't been back since then, but that was, uh, and, and the goose hunting was pretty good. Yeah. Torrington, so. Torrington's interesting. Wyoming's funny, man. You, if you think Torrington's pretty, you got to come over here <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> we've yeah. got mountains. So, yeah. oh man, no, yeah. it's Wyoming's Wyoming's funny. Um, the, the West in general is funny because you'll get areas where there's nothing, there are no birds at all. There's nothing to hold them. They don't go through there whatever and then you get places like torrington where you're right on the it's right dead center in the flyway and 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 it gets tons of birds and there's ag there to hold them you've got the north platte river that flows through there so you've got they've got water places to roost and they have they'll literally have thousands and thousands tens of thousands of birds all winter long and you know and then obviously that you got that whole uh rocky mountain front in Colorado and Eastern Colorado that that's good. And Torrance is just North of that. So it's cool. There's, and there's a lot of that, but it's, it's so, you know, it's so spotty. You, you gotta be, basically it's all water related. If there, if, yeah. if you've got a big river or a, a water system, you'll probably have birds. You'll probably wow. have birds and, and, and they winter here, you know, they'll, yeah. they winter, they'll, they'll bump up and down. We did a hunt with, uh, with Jim Sobeer from Sitka last year. And he, that day was crazy because we had nasty weather. I mean, it was 20 below with wind chill and bird birds were, they were migrating. They were migrating out of Montana, flying down that river system. 
And I call, we had another hunt lined up for the next day. And I, I had a couple fields lined out, but it wasn't, it, well, I didn't have anything really like I was really excited about, you know? Yeah. Right. I thought, well, well, we'll traffic some birds and it'll be fine. And I called down and, and to one of the guys down here and I said, man, all these, there's a lot of birds moving and it's not that far. So tell me what's going on. And he's like, dude, I'm sitting here looking at probably 5,000 birds that literally just showed up here on the river this today. Yeah. And I went perfect. And we went out the next morning and yeah, we had a great hunt. So it changes constantly because of, because of weather out here that time of year and it does everywhere, you know, but they'll migrate down and then they'll reverse migrate the next week because the weather warms up and they're just shifting around all the time. But yeah, they did the same here. Same here as well. What are, are probably, I mean, a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, here you get up in the air. Goodness, there's so much water, so much habitat. But then again, there's so much pressure. I mean, it's sure. like, I mean, I'm, I'm growing. I mean, it's just thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of water that someplace you just, you measure by miles, not by acres. I mean, it's just crazy. Right. You know, the habitat. But then again, it's, it's, it's also a negative because there's so much pressure. And now a lot of our birds are, have shifted west and, and, and you know, and, I mean, man, there's, it's just, it's just a different dynamic than 30 years ago. Um, and and I, I'm sure th- things will come back around, but it's, it's still tough. You know, Sean, Sean Stahl and I talked about that very thing about it's like, instead of the waterfall evolution, it's more like the waterfall revolution. What, what yeah. goes around comes around, you know, and yep. whether it's decoys, blinds, calls, it, it seems like everything makes its way back around. And I think you're going to see that. Well, I know you're going to see that with birds where patterns have shifted. You guys talk, you talk about earlier in the podcast about having hundreds of thousands of geese, you know, that, oh, they yeah. used, that used to blow you guys up. And now it's not that way. I could see that. Oh, yeah. I could see that shifting, you know, due to in, in hunting pressure shifts things where they get blown out of an area for years and years and years. So they shift West, like you said, and then they get blown out over there over a 10 year cycle. And then in 20 years, they're back on you. You know, yeah. it's, it's funny. Yeah. It's a dynamic thing and, and being flexible and being able to, to move and play that game. It seems like yeah. there's, there's spots that are good no matter what, but man, it definitely changes from year to year. There's, there's yeah. no doubt. And even, even bigger than that, you know, from decade to decade, I was mm-hmm. talking to, uh, we've got a, a crew of guys that's done a, a goose hunt in northern Michigan, um, yeah. in the Upper Peninsula, in a very historic, kind of top end of the flyway hunt. Where man, back in the when I was younger, and before that, from the from basically from the sixties, seventies, all the way up through, that hunting has gone up and down. Where yeah. you get years, you get a ten year period where you you're covered up in geese, and then a five year window where man, I hardly have any birds to shoot at all. Wow. And, and that's at the head of the flyway. I mean, that's at the head of the migration in the U S there, you got birds that fly yeah. when, when they leave Hudson Bay, the, that's the first decoy spread they see. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy how they shift and do different things. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's, but it's Our fun. Biggest, our biggest trouble, you know, on the, on the Canada goose, I mean, it, of course there's so many variables, but you know, the, the reintroduction of the giant Canada goose in a lot of these urban areas is right. really, really been, I mean, there's a, we can go in off of, I mean, I've got a lot of a, a theory on the, the whole evolution of that, but, but that, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough pill to overcome, you know, and you, when you have your, the combination of your, your resident Canada goose ex- explosion, and you have the combination of no-till farming becoming better where the farmers aren't tilling up the cornfields in the fall like normal. And then you have all of your cooling power lakes where there's, there's, I mean, they're intaking water at, at freezing almost, and then they're discharging it at 45, 50 degrees. So you're having huge, you know, when, unless you get two feet of snowfall, that goose will always have open water to roost in at night, always. Right. It's always going to have a field to go feed in where that grain has not been turned out under with dirt, with no-till farming. And then not only that, he's going to have a million of his buddies that he thinks are his buddies. But right. they're genetically designed not to migrate. Right. So, right. Add all of that, your your strong survive, your weak die off, and you evolve into what we have now to where we don't get any geese anymore. That's and it's, uh, I mean, and a, a good a friend of mine years ago, 
and I'll never forget him telling me this is back in the 90s. He said, Kelly, what's a migratory goose now? He said, seriously, give me a definition of a migratory Canada goose. And I said, well, th- th-, he said, yeah, but you're having so much residents and, and migratory, they're, they're, they're crossbreeding and they're di- like, it's a different. And, and not only that, but we were, ha- and what triggered the conversation is I shot a net collar down here and, uh, and, and the net collar is, a. uh, uh there wasn't a, a leg bank, or there was a. I, I swear it had a neck collar, but went to pick the bird up, and it, and the collar was gone, and and I called him, and I was like, "Hey, what's the story of this? I know there's a collar, but I need to keep looking. Of course, it was in flooded water. And oh, he, he he did a check of the band for me. It's like, oh no, no, you need to still look. There's a there's a collar there with it. Well, anyway, but make a long story short, he did a a trace of the number. Well, the goose was banded, you know, it was trapped at a Detroit city park, was transplanted to the UP. And that goose technically was a, a resident, but he ended up in Tennessee because they had a huge snowstorm. Uh-huh. So now we got a technical, you have a, I mean, the survival instincts kick in. Like, I mean, there were, it, it was such a tragic snowstorm and winter event. I mean, it was like once in a 20 year period deal. And that goose ended up, and ever since that winter, I noticed even our ponds around, we, we acquired resident geese that, that they came from at that event. Now, that's not a migratory goose. Technically, by definition, genetically, that's not a migratory goose. Sure. It's, not an interior, it's not an interior. You know, he's technically a, a giant. But it goes back to my buddy's conversation, define a migratory Canada goose. You know, yes, genetically, we can do that. But technically, you've got the migratory part, even of residents as well. It's just a big mess that we created. I mean, granted, resident Canada goose has created hunting opportunities for a lot of people. Right, you know, but they become a nuisance to a lot of people. And when you take that on top of no-till farming, on top of nuclear power plants and warm water discharge lakes, it's a recipe for to stopping a migration. That's interesting. I, yeah, no, I I completely agree because we don't have any of that out here. So our birds, yeah. they're really they're truly migrating. And you go yep. you go around right now. I've got tabs. I wish we had an early goose season out here that started September 1st, but we don't have the resident goose population to support, you know, a, a season. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I was driving around the other night with kids in, in the car and Hey, there's 350 Canada's in a, you know, in a, in a fresh cut barley field. Yep. And yep. I'm going, man, if I was back in Michigan, I'd be all over that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so and they're the, and they're feeding right along the edge of the irrigation ditch, so there's you know, head high grass to hide in. I'm like, I don't even need to use layout blinds out there. Just set up an A frame or hunker in the ditch and shoot them. And yeah, you know, and here's, um, the, here's the theory: go go north of you, you know, uh, that place an hour north. All right, let's let's dump off you know a hundred thousand residents, g- true giant Canada's, and let's put a power plant right beside it where the lake will never freeze. And then you, if, if it's a farming community, they're going to be no-till farming anyway. That's that's just a common practice now because it's profitable. Right. Well, then come back to me in five years and tell me what your migration has, what has happened. It is, it is. There's, I mean, and and I've been saying it for years. I would, I, I do. I wish there was more of a biologist standpoint that would start that conversation. But it's it's almost like a taboo. Nobody kind of goes there. But man, there are communities, sure. especially in the Midwest. You know, from Marion, Illinois, where Crab Orchard is at, to Union County at the Horseshoe Lake Refuge, like traditional hotbeds for Canada geese that they won't get a hundred geese almost. Wow. Like it wow. is, and and you can go on the Midwest. Just look at the map, pull a map up, follow the follow the Mississippi River up, especially when you get in Illinois, the Illinois River up. You can see the the warm water discharge places, and I get that they're cooling the reactors, they're cooling the engines, and I understand that, but. Follow that up, and you look at the towns, and you know the type of resident population they have in those towns, and you can see to where, through time, Johnny Migrator Goose flies in. He sees a bunch of his buddies down there that look like him, talk like him, act like him, but technically they're not like him genetically. Right. right. He hangs out with hangs out with those guys. They get a big snowfall, and he's wondering why aren't they leaving? I normally should be leaving, so he just stays around. Well, now we're technically we're making that goose tougher. If a weak one's there, he dies off. The strong survive, and it evolves into the species are are becoming stronger and more adaptive to those scenarios, and they just they don't go to the, any further destination south. Right, right, yeah, and 
and we and like I said, we see that here because of honestly the, the Yellowstone River. That thing really does. I mean, it'll freeze up in places, but a, a goose or a duck doesn't have to look hard on that thing to find open water that he can yeah. sit, that he can sit on. And yeah, the corn thing is 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 no till. A lot of the stuff we grow out here, they it's bare dirt all winter long, and oh, wow. uh, they they till. You know, there's a lot of barley, and they'll till that under. Um, there's a lot of there's sugar beet production, beans like garbanzo beans. Um, and yeah. they'll 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 till that stuff under. There won't be any. There won't be much. Although I've seen a lot of geese in in beet fields eating eating beet tops. You know those yeah. those, those beet wow. greens after after the harvest because that's sitting out there and they go out and just mow those things. And well, of course, it's, you know the, it's but it is interesting, like you said, they how how things have changed. It's it's crazy. Well, and and the I mean, of course, you know years ago when the big push with and, and granted we're farmers, so I see it from the farming side. Sure, the big sure. Pu- the big push, the big push with ethanol, you know, and they're t- basically you know in it corn base and they're using that corn so. Corn production has skyrocketed in, in, in the Dakotas and, and the northern areas, you know, and when corn production increases in conjunction with no-till farming and corn is being a high protein food source, which is what they need when it gets super cold. And if there's any excess grain on the ground, man, it's it's a I mean, it's good for the species. Don't get me wrong. That's that's good. It's good for the habitat. But at the end of the day, when migrations are are almost stopped you know it, it's a i don't i don't see it recovering i don't and at the end of the day too i don't know the answer i i, I think i feel like i pretty much put my finger on what's causing it but i i'm not in fan of government regulation and i'm not you know i mean I, i'm i'm not in kind of like let people do what they want to do you know for the most part but i i just i don't know man it's a it's a good conversation i think we should have but I, i'm not going to sit here and beat a drum telling you i know the right answer or, right or how to fix it Yep. No, I, I think you're right there. And I'd, I'd agree with you. It's, it's, it's interesting to hear, you know, your perspective on it being someone who, who's, you know, grown up, cut his teeth and grown up hunting in, in those migration dependent area and a migration dependent area, you know, cause I, I remember when Michigan opened their resident goose pop, their resident goose hunt that was started September 1st. And we were hunting everybody. Now it's a thing. Everybody does it and they get the whole month of September. And back yeah. then, back then it was 10 days. And yeah. it, was, it was just to mop up some, try to mop up some of those giants that didn't migrate and were, like you said, making a mess out of things, making a nuisance of themselves and try to help control that population some. But yeah, it's amazing that the face of everything has changed. There's no doubt. And I'd be interested to talk to some of the young guys you know, and that are just getting, just getting started in it now, you know, like, like Kyle Jones, like you were saying, and Mm -hmm. in another 10 or 15 years and see what they've noticed, you know, and and, and, and how things have changed, changed them. Yeah. Cause we can look back into the nineties and go, well, it was like this, or even the late eighties and go, ah, it was like this. And it's interesting. Like I said, getting back to that, talking to different hunters, all the young guys, the old guys, the middle-aged guys, you get a different perspective on things but it's all connected to that common thread of waterfowl hunting. And yeah. And one of the reasons I love even the times I've been hunted out West, everything ha- happens naturally. You know, migration happens naturally when, when there's, there's barometric pressure changes, when weather systems come through high pressure, ducks migrate, geese migrate, you know, and there's so many more factors in, in the Mississippi flyway going up that help that hurts you. You know, and it's just a, it's just a little more of a complex, especially on a Canada goose standpoint. You know, like I said, you just look at look at the look at the urban areas in the Midwest, you know, Mississippi Flyway that have large populations of resident Canada geese, and compare that to places further west, and you just you don't have it. You know, you don't have it at all, and and it's a it's a very it's a big contributing factor. And goodness, when the duck listen when the when the mallards start when the mallards start following suit you're you're you think it's bad on the goose hunt you're, Arkansas, uh, you're Arkansas guy and hey me I'm one of them too you know like, oh boy now it's all right this is getting bad you that's know? like holy but, grail stuff you're messing with right there <laughs> yeah and, and listen and there's a lot of those guys will tell you it's it's nowhere near like it used to be and it's not I mean it's different right. you know it, but but it, if they, it, it's happened on Canada geese it can happen on the ducks too that's I've seen it I, I've are. seen it I, I'll never forget I was I'll never forget the first time I saw mallards 
in a cornfield. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm not, it wasn't flooded corn. This was, this was way after season closed. It was the middle of the winter in Michigan, and there's a thousand mallards tornadoing into a stubble into a corn stubble field. Mm-hmm. I had never seen anything like that before, and it was. I think I was in high school when I saw that, and it. I was kind of like, "Wow, man, that would be yeah. fun. That'd be fun to be camped out underneath of, you know, because I'd seen it hunting beaver ponds, and everything was migration oriented with ducks. Yeah. And from that point forward, it seemed like seasons were in, started running later. We started shooting a a lot of ducks." in fields in december and even you know late 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 and for us and they just don't go anywhere you know and it's yeah. kind of it's kind of like you i saw that build up so on the other end of it on the south end of that of that mississippi flyway you're looking at like you said the duck numbers aren't there like they used to be historically and All i think right. it, like everybody's got their their ideas but i just remember the first time i saw that and what you're talking about it, that I'd never seen ducks in a, in a cornfield yeah. in January before. Yeah. And it was, yeah. I'll, I'll never forget that. It was like a snowy blizzardy day. And there's just this tornado of mallards. And, and now good grief. We hunt that all the time. I mean, that's, time, that's, yeah. that's one of our go-tos, especially when it's cold, especially when it's cold, you know, it, it gets 15 or 20 below and I don't want to put my dog in that river. You know, when it's, when it's like that, let's go find a field. And if it's exactly. snowy and crappy, those birds are going to be in it when it's shooting light. You know, other, otherwise, you end up there in there at night, and they feed all night, and you can't get a crack at them in a field. Then you got to hunt the river. Dude. But yeah, oh yeah, I know. Interesting, interesting dynamic of things changing. But you know, you just adapt. You just do what you still what you can do. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that is cool. Kelly, I have had a great time visiting with you. We're st- we're staring at an hour and 21 minutes in the face and it's gone like the blink of an eye. That's that was a you're super insightful, man. I mean, I I was thinking we're going to talk calls and we're going to talk this and that. The next thing you know, the migration talk was about the last thing I figured would come <laughs> up, but I that's why I love this format, this style of podcast instead of having a scripted written out interview I've got a few things to talk about and then let's just roll. And that's what we did. We just rolled the conversation. I I appreciate your time. I appreciate your, your coming on and being willing to chat with us. And I got one question to close this out that I've been asking everybody. If you could only, if you could only hunt one bird one way, what's it going to be? Oh, mallards in the timber. (laughs) That's the, that has been the answer so far. I've gotten a few things different, but mallards in the timber. I'll add to that real quick. Got years ago, people would say, "Man, Tennessee boy, blowing a goose call. What are you doing? In blowing these goose calling competitions?" I said, "Man, don't don't let me fool you. Hunting mallards in timber is is where my heart's at. Sure, <laughs> I mean, you know, sure. It's it's what I love doing. So and and you know we anyway we we do a little bit of it here and and most of it's willow willow breaks and and a little bit of hard you know green timber stuff. But uh, uh that's that that that's epic for me." Yeah, I think the closest we got to that is we had some ponds that were in the woods, and uh, and some beaver pond type stuff. We didn't, but that was about the closest growing up that we got. Of course, we don't get anything like that in out here in the West. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, we got a, we got a lot of a lot of a lot of big big flats, and and you get of course in Arkansas you get the big oak flats and all that. Right. But but uh, yeah, honey, when, when they're coming through those trees, there's nothing like it. One of the places that's close, uh, one of our farms that. My dad grew up on. We've got there's there's timber stuff there, and you know that little little timber hose and stuff that we. Oh man, I love it. You know, it's just that's a, so cool. Now, granted, I I can go over in Arkansas and have better hunting, but we can let it set and build up birds, and it's it's pretty good. You know, we can have some good good uh, good good hunts out of it. That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, Kelly, thanks again for being on, and I hope we can hook up one of these days and maybe share a blind together. That'd be a lot of fun. And good that's luck fun. this fall. Absolutely. Anytime, man. Just I'd love to do it again. All right. Well, thanks again, and I'll talk to you again soon. All right. Sounds good.